Okay, so today we'll, we'll do hearing. And uh, it, hearing is sort of underestimated how important it is. Um, you, always, you think, of course, as vision as your most important uh, sense, but hearing uh, can be very difficult to, uh, to, to be able to cope without hearing. Um, one feels very isolated if one doesn't have hearing. If you sit down for dinner with a family and you have you can't lip read and you don't understand what's going on and with friends, um, it can have a very isolating um, effect. Um, and in children, if they lack hearing, you often misdiagnose them as some, having some sort of um, cognitive impairment, uh, but uh, that's not the case. Uh, it can be, it's, a, it's important to think, it, it can have, it can save your life many times in terms of not being, uh, not being run over by a car, unless, of course, as some of you do, you wear your earphones around the, the campus and walk into the street without looking. And of course, um, some people, especially in old age, have this ringing in their ear which can uh, drive you nuts. But what, what, what is sound, okay? And we'll make a lot of noise here for a minute to wake those up that hadn't had enough coffee. So you can speak, speaker moves waves form, and then you hear something, <coughs> okay? But you don't hear something um, during, so first you have to have these speakers, they compress and rarefy the air, then this compressed and rarefied air travels at the speed of sound and takes some time before reaches the ear, and then it moves your eardrum, and through the process we'll talk about today, um, we'll find out what, how that produces electrical activity, and that is sensed in your cortex. But um, with, without uh, this thing moving, and, the, and, and these waves tra traveling, uh, none of this would occur inside your ear. Now here you can see two things happening. One was that, that the, the, the speaker moved back and forth a lot and then a little. In each case it either produced a big uh, um, sort of compression uh, or in this other case a very soft compression. That in turn traveled down and pushed the eardrum a little a little bit or hard for the loud sound. So the amount of the, of the pressure wave um, varies with sound. The other thing that happens is that it um, um, varies in frequency. So you can see here, whoops, here the, 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 the speaker vibrating very quickly. As a consequence, you have many traveling waves coming down in, in succession to the eardrum that then vibrates quickly or slowly. And it's by this difference in how many, how quickly or slowly the eardrum vibrates that you uh, sense different frequencies. Now, normally, you can hear all the way from 20 to 20,000 hertz, and hertz is cycles per second. So that's quite a few times it vibrates back and forth within one second. Uh, you're best at hearing uh, this range, 2,000 to 4,000, because that's the range uh, which you, the human voice occurs. Now, I mentioned it hits the eardrum. So this here, out before the eardrum, is called the outer ear. You have this long canal 
um, that you shouldn't stick anything into, even a Q-tip. Um, but the the skin on 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 the around the the ear canal has a wonderful property. The skin is continuously growing out of your ear canal like a conveyor belt, and it does this to sort of move move the automatically the wax buildup out of your ear so that that the wax won't build up in your ear unless something goes wrong then in here this is called the middle ear and it is unlike this is liquid okay um, and it contains these bones called the ossicles, and they transfer, transfer the vibrations from the eardrum to this window here. And then the next stage is over here, and that's the inner ear, and that contains this thing that's called the cochlea, and it is this snail-like object that goes round and round and round. And within it, you have a sheet of that contains uh, neurons. And this sheet surprisingly gets wider as it goes to this thin end of the cochlea. So this on this sheet, all your neurons are contained. Okay, so here what I've done is change the cochlea from this rounded structure to this rectangular structure. And here you see the, the membrane on which all the cells are in, in yellow here, but again, getting wider at this end. Again, you have your eardrum, your ossicles, and your cochlea. And again, air out here air over here, and fluid over here. So what's the function of these things, the, the ossicles in the middle ear? This thing is the eardrum, this thing is the oval window. And when you air compresses against um, the, the, this, this outer eardrum. This is air, and over here it has to push against fluid. And it's like having this light molecule uh, hitting this heavy molecule, and if something like uh, a ping-pong ball strikes a billiard ball, uh, that ping-pong ball will bounce off the billiard ball without moving it. And the similar thing would happen to um, the vibrations coming from the outside. They wouldn't move this fluid at all. So what this uh, ossicles do is they act like a lever system. It's like the jack of your car. With the jack in your car, little old you can lift up the weight of a car. Similarly, with a lever, a very small object can lift a big, heavy object. And so the, 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 this, these ossicles transmit all the force of, of the vibrations coming in down into here and push against this fluid. The other thing that happens is that there is a muscle attached to this, this ossicle. And the brain can contract this muscle. And it does so in two situations. The first happens before you speak. The vibrations that pro are produced when you speak can damage your eardrum. 
or not your eardrum, your the, the cells in, in, in on your basilar membrane. And so every each time before you speak, this muscle contracts and uh, reduces how much this vibration occurs. It also gets activated by very other very loud sounds, external sounds, but they come the, re the reaction to them comes after the sound. So unless it's a long sound, like, like you're going to a concert, um, it can prevent, can't prevent the initial impact, but it can prevent the sustained loud noise from damaging your uh, cells. So what happens after that? Well, you can see here that this thing called an oval window gets pushed. That in turn produces a, a dimple in your basal membrane. But only if there's another window called the round window lets out the fluid. If this was sealed, okay, again, this oval window would move. It'd be like pushing on um, the, something compressed in the can. You can't compress fluid. You just can displace this fluid. So this round window acts like a pressure release valve. Now on the basilar membrane, you've got these things called hair cells. And these hair cells are remarkable little inventions. Okay, they have an odd shape to them. First of all, they have a crew cut like shape. So there's short fibers down here and long fibers down here. The, the longest one um, you will find out uh, how, how gives this thing a, a direction. Now, the, the most remarkable thing about this remarkable cell is that at the end of each of these hairs, it's got even a tinier hair that lifts up a flap every time it's bent. Okay? And when that flap is lifted up, then potassium enters the cell and raises the cell's voltage. And when that happens, transmitter, the, the cell releases transmitter, um, depolarizes the eighth nerve afferent, and sends exponentials down to your brain. Now, this is a mechanical opening, and that allows it to respond very quickly to any vibration that occurs. Um, um, something like a, a receptor uh, opening uh, takes, it might take time for the, for the receptor to bind and then any change in the uh, conduction to occur. This happens very quickly in microseconds. And that we'll find is very useful for high frequency sounds and for detecting the location of a sound. Now, once that little bulge occurs here, that little bulge travels down the basilar membrane. It's like uh, if you took a, uh, a whip and flicked it, it would travel down the length of the whip. What, what is interesting about uh, this wave as it travels is that it gets bigger and then it gets smaller again. So it doesn't say, stay the same size. It does so because uh, the basilar membrane is tuned like the strings of a piano, okay? This end over here has, is narrow and stiff. This end over here 
is wide and floppy. And so this end over here responds best to high frequency waves, whereas this end over here responds best to low frequency waves, and of course everything else in the middle. So you can see here a low frequency wave and a high frequency wave occurring. And so Okay, so you heard that tune. You heard that tune not because your brain in your side of your head, uh, a neuron, uh, had action potentials at each of those three frequencies. No, it's because three different hair cells were activated, okay? And each one played in sequence. So this one played, then this one played, and then this one played, or back and forth, I forget the exact sequence. But, so you're he hearing different tones. Is your hearing the activity, or you're sensing the activity of a particular neuron? When this neuron is active, you hear that tone. When another neuron is active, you hear another tone. Kind of neat. It's like the labeled line in touch. When that afferent was active, you felt um, a sensation of, of, uh, of smoothness. When another afferent was touched, you felt your limbs, your fingers being stretched or contracted. You can see here that what is encoded by frequency is loudness. A loud sound will vibrate this hair cell more at this location, and a soft sound will vibrate it less, and so you get more action potentials for a loud sound, less action potentials for a soft sound. Now, when you hear something like that, you hear all kinds of things at once, okay? And your, your, your basilar membrane is acting like a synthesizer, okay? I don't know how many you, of you have played with a synthesizer, but a synthesizer has, you can change the levels over here, which are these frequencies, and you can change the levels over here, which are these frequencies. And it's a combination of all those frequencies that gives you the sensation of that particular piece of music. Now, this thing, of course, can get damaged. And a very loud sound, like uh, uh, something like a gun, uh, an explosion, or the sound of a gun close to your ear, can break your eardrum or are you poking down there can break your eardrum. The other thing that can do is you can, those, those hair cells can disappear from too much vibration. Um, it is easy to tell if someone has been the drummer in a rock band <laughs> because he'll be missing hair cells at the low frequencies, okay, they'll be gone, and they don't come back. The other thing that can occur is that fluid can fill this middle ear, and that occurs when you get an ear infection. And what will happen then, of course, is that that as that fluid filled, it produces a bulge in your eardrum. And that's what, what a doctor looks for when he stick, sticks this instrument into your ear and looks down to your ear. And he's trying to see if this thing is bulging. The other thing that can happen is that this opening, when, when the when the channels get this, the top of the each hair opens up, 
let, lets these ions in, but it's, it's an opening, it's a physical opening. So all kinds of other things can enter the cell as well. And um, early, <coughs> early forms of antibiotics um, proved, um, produced deafness in, 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 in patients. And that's because those antibiotics weren't suitable for these hair cells, and the hair cells died as a consequence of the uh, antibiotic particles entering the hair cell. And of course, then there's old age. You hear this creaking sound in the distance. And of course, a lot of things wear out. Um, we can have blood supply being blocked because of a variety of things, and that, of course, will cause hair cells to, uh, cells to die. And they're not re re replaced. Okay. So we saw that we can tell uh, the frequency of sound by which hair cell is active. We can tell the loudness of a sound by the amount of action potentials that, that are coming down the windpipe. And we can also tell uh, its location. Okay? And we can tell that because we have two ears. Like the eyes, we can compare what's coming in one eye and the other eye, and see in stereo. Here we can tell the location of the sound. So you can hear sounds coming from different parts of the room. Okay? And you can hear that because there's a difference in loudness between the two ears. That's done best with high frequency sounds because um, they don't bend around the shadow that the head forms. So you can see that, that here uh, the, the, the skull produces a shadow for one ear. And of course, it, then it he hears it less well. If it was a low frequency sound, it would tend to hug the, the skull and produce approximately equal sensation to both ears. But then we've got a different cue. We have timing differences between the two ears. So if a sound is coming, like over here, from the left side, it'll hit the left ear first, and then the right ear second. And from this timing difference, surprisingly, the brain can tell which direction the sound is coming from. And this works best for low frequency sounds. Now, to be able to tell uh, the difference between the two years, it's not uh, this difference in timing that occurs. It's a very tiny amount of difference in time to be able to tell about it. You can tell a one degree difference in direction by this timing cue. Uh, and to do that, you've got to estimate this amount of time. And so the year, because those hair cells open and close, depending on when something hits that ear, and they quickly respond, uh, that allows you to measure that difference in timing. Okay. Then the shape of the earlobe is very important in giving you cues as to where the sound is coming from. Um, as of course, it's, it, 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 it points to the front of the head, and so sounds behind you are less, and that gives you a clue of where it's coming. But also it can tell, helps you tell whether it's from above or below. And you notice these, your earlobes 
have sort of funny shapes to them. They've got all kinds of curves and indentations and whatnot. These have a purpose. They produce little echoes in the different sounds that enter your ear. And from these little echoes, you're able, your brain is able to deduce whether the sound is coming from above or below you. The other thing you can do is the ear, because it's pointing in a certain direction, um, it, it's, it acts like a, an antenna, a directional antenna. And so you can turn your head to where the sound is loudest and localize it that way. You notice that animals, like uh, especially uh, rabbits, turn their ears in different directions in order to, to tell where the sound is coming from. They're using their ears as directional antennas. Then, of course, other sensory modalities um, uh, sort of uh, give you a clue of where the sound is coming from, especially vision. Um, and if you're watching a movie, you assume that the sound is coming from where, what, wh whichever of the two actors is speaking, okay? You're one, speak one, one person speaking on the right and, um, and his lips, his or her lips are moving. You sort of sense the sound is coming from that direction. And that uh, perception is, or false perception, is used by ventriloquists. Um, they move the lips of the, the dummy and you're, you assume that the sound is coming from wh wh whatever lips are being moved. Now, the sounds come from the hair cells. They go along the eighth nerve. They, they, they go through this bipolar cell to the cochlear nucleus. And then from there, um, they go to the superior olivary nucleus. Now, uh, this one, the sound from over here, crosses over and also goes to the olivary nucleus. So this olivary nucleus is the first place in your brain where the two sounds get together. And so the olivary nucleus compares the sounds coming from the two ears. The circuit here, the the mirror image of it occurs on this side as well, so everything's symmetric. And there are two parts of the very nucleus. There's the lateral part that measures the intensity differences between the two years, and there's the medial part that measures the timing differences between the two years. From there, uh, the signal travels to the inferior colliculus. And for example, in the inferior colliculus, you have uh, a, a topological code for the location of the sound. Like the topological code, co code that you had for the visual location of an object. So in the superior colliculus, you have uh, visual cues of where objects are. In the inferior colliculus, you have auditory cues of where an object is. And there's a connection between the inferior and superior colliculus. So if you hear a sound that at that location, the same location is activated in the superior colliculus, and you turn your eyes and head towards that object. So rather than a visual grasp reflex, you have an auditory grasp reflex. Oh, and finally, um, the sound goes through the thalamus and to the primary auditory cortex, which we'll cover just in a moment. Before we do that, a little quiz. Okay, so again, hit the table as hard as you can uh, for the correct answer. So what you see here is... Um, an action potential occurring here, then a millisecond later, two actions potentials occurring, then three, then four, 
than five. What is it that you're hearing? Okay. Is it five similar sounds played one after another every millisecond? Five sounds of increasing frequency that are played. So, Greg, this is uh, a low frequency, higher, higher, higher. No. Okay. Five, five sounds are played of increasing intensity. A. Okay. One sound of a. a, a a thousand hertz is played, um, I guess, continuously. Not a very good thing. N okay, no one answered that one. Good. Okay, the next one. Five sounds are played shifting from the left to the right. Tricky one. It's right. If five sounds were played shifting from the left to the right, and this was, let's say, um, a hair, uh, a, a cell, let's say, in your olivary nucleus, it would detect that the sound was louder from this year than less loud, more loud, or less loud from this year, more loud from this year. It would be increasing. The same effect as the increase in intensity. So both these two things could be right. Okay, the, where, where does it go from here? So it goes to the primary auditory cortex. And over here, uh, the basilar membrane is mapped onto the, the cortex. You have low frequencies over at this end, high frequencies over this end. Again, you have a columnar organization. And in each column, Cells with the same frequency occur. Cells are activated by sounds of the same frequency. So f sounds are f first processed by the structure called A1, the primary auditory cortex. And then sounds are processed in higher areas, A2 that surround it. And these sounds are activated best for word-like, or this area here is activated best for word-like sounds. And these word-like sounds are called phonemes. They're like ba, ga, ar, el. They're, they're, they're the basic building blocks of what might be a word. From there, sounds go to this important area called vertices area. And that is important because this is where the word is first put together in terms of a sound. And it, it's an area that's important for word comprehension. Now, new, newborns, regardless of where they come from, whatever part of the world, can distinguish the same set of phonemes. So ba versus pa, and, and there, there's a variety of phonemes. And the, a child anywhere in the world will be able to distinguish the same set equally. Now, as you age, and, 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 and this aging occurs at, uh, at ends at the end of six months, uh, the, these, the, 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 the auditory system starts um, producing, sort of, start acting like a, a magnet. So a sound like pa will be heard better by these neurons. A sound like ba will be heard better by these neurons and nothing in between. Now try saying pa and ba. What's the difference between two? Just one is pa, which is your your you your 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 air pressure opens up your your lips. Okay, 
pa, you blow your lips open. Ba is you open up your lips. Okay? So it has a slightly slower rise in sound. Just a small little difference. But you can't hear. You, you, when I say pa, when I, if you changed your lips or a different person speaking slightly with a different uh, uh, sort of onset of the sound, uh, they'll hear one or the other, but not both because of these magnetic-like structures in the auditory system. So they produce a clear boundary by the end of six months. Now, how do you... What happened there? Well, this you have a baby, and it's sleeping most of the time. But it hears these sounds. And when it hears these sounds, it wakes up and stucks, starts sucking on this pacifier. And we can record the, 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 the sucking of this pacifier. So the scientist went around the world sticking these pacifiers into babies' mouths and playing sounds like pa versus ba. Now you go pa, 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 pa to a baby for, you know, 10 minutes. You'll get bored and it'll fall asleep. But when that pa changes to a ba, it'll wake up. Well, what, what have you done? You found out that it can detect the difference between the two. That's a different sound. And so you know that baby can recognize that, the difference between those phonemes. And you can go through all the phonemes. And these scientists found that in the first six months, everyone could recognize the same set. But then you had these magnets form. And so in, in English, uh, and if you're in an English environment, you start hearing R's or L's. Now again, there's a slight difference. R, L. L, you put your, 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 your tongue close to your teeth. R, you put it back further in your, down your throat. And you can move your tongue back and forth, practice this at home, and, and, and you'll hear R or L, but nothing in between, okay? Because of these magnets. Now, if you were raised in, in a Japanese environment, there are no R's and L's. I forget which of these, these there is. But both are heard equally. Uh, so an R or an L will produce the same sound. You'll hear it the same way if you're, if you're raised in, in that environment. Similarly, there are phonemes in the Japanese environment that don't exist if you're raised in the English environment, and you won't hear those differences in phonemes. As a consequence, uh, once you, these magnets are formed, if you change your culture, if you move to a place um, that, that, that with a, a different set of phonemes, you will not hear that difference. So you'll keep saying whatever it is you're saying, but not notice that there's a difference in the language that, you, that you're speaking. Okay, from there, let's, let's then look at what other areas are involved in sound, okay? To do that, let's, let's suppose you're reading out loud, okay? So uh, you see something, so you activate cells, you see a, a, a word. And so you first analyze the, those, that word, in terms of your, your visual cortex, primary visual cortex. You start detecting the edges of all the letters. Then, that then information goes down to a structure called the visual word form area. 
Now the visual word form area is interesting because it forms at the back end of your left fusiform face area. Okay? So your fusiform face area has a right side and a left side. In order to recognize faces, uh, either can be used or both, uh, but to recognize letters, as you learn uh, words, not letters, as you learn words, uh, the back end of your left fusiform starts recognizing these words. And it recognizes these words in quickly, instantly, with practice. So it's like recognizing faces. You can tell a face right away. Uh, it, 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 you don't have to look through the different features and say it's that face or this face. Okay, It's that face. Similarly with a word. Uh, you learn with practice to recognize that word instantly as to what it means. You don't have to read through your individual letters in order to tell what the word is. Now, you remember that without an FFA, you've got prosopagnosia. You can't tell fa faces. Well, similarly, if you've got uh, something wrong with the back end of your left FFA, uh, this word, visual word form area, you have dyslexia. You are unable to recognize words just by its vision. You have to carefully read through the letters, and that slows you down. And so you have uh, dyslexia. Now, um, your ability to recognize faces is uh, something that's genetically pre-programmed. You, you, you don't have to practice recognizing faces. You'll recognize faces just automatically. But we weren't genetically pre-programmed to read. Okay? Our ability to read, writing just became popular in, in about 200 years ago since the printing press came out. And even then, there's not much genetic uh, sort of imprinting in 200 years that can occur. So this area is sort of raw still to, you can think of it as being uh, not, 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 not tuned to the ability to read words. And you have to, with a lot of training, push it to be able to read words. And that's why reading can be very difficult for some people. So after this interesting structure, we go to the PTO, which is an association area. And so we can um, get um, to be able to recognize these, this, this thing called an apple in a variety of ways. You can recognize that something's an apple from the word or from its picture or from its feel or by its taste. The same thing represents apple. And then we go from there to the Wernicke's area where you have the verbal representation of the, the, the word that you see. And again, this, this area here um, is, is an association area because you can hear the word, or you can read the word, or you can feel the word through Braille. Now, you remember that we had here nearby um, an area called SST, which was involved in biological motion. Okay, And one of the biological motions that you can perceive is your lips moving. And this has an influence on what words you recognize. So, for example, ba, uh, when you hear ba, but you see lips moving as ga, you can you have a conflict. Uh, well, I w hopefully this works, and we can see. Ba. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Ba. 
now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. Okay, from there, another important area is activated called Broca's area, and that's important for verbal expression. And of course, this is part of your uh, frontal lobe. Um, okay, everything in front of this line is the frontal lobe, and that's where we saw working memory being represented. And of course, one would need working memory in order to put the words of the sentence that you want to, to say in the right order. Or if you're reading uh, or hearing a sentence, you, could, you have to put, again, the words into your uh, verbal memory to, in order to figure out what's happening. What's the object? What's the verb? What's the subject of the sentence? And finally, we would activate the facial areas of the motor cortex, and that will in turn produce the sound that we're trying to say. Now, we can have lesions of these areas. So if you have a lesion of Wernicke's area, uh, the person won't understand language. So if, if he hears some, a word being spoken, uh, the person won't have any understanding of what he hears. But a person can, can develop, can still say words, but, be, but they'll often be nonsense words because this area is not producing the right understanding. In contrast, you can hear, produce a lesion here, which will affect your ability to say the right word or just to say the right grammar. So this, this, this is a structure, again, that puts the sentence together in the right order, so its damage will affect the grammar of the sentence as well. But you can still understand what you're hearing. So you can be saying the wrong thing and hear yourself saying the wrong thing, of course, that could get a very, pretty frustrating. Now, um, deaf people use something called the American Sign Language, or many deaf people, to in order to communicate, and that involves gesturing um, uh, words with one's hands. And surprisingly, the same areas are involved. So Broca's area is involved in the expression of, 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 of words and Wernicke's with the comprehension of these expressions or gestures. So these areas are not just limited to the sound of words by, by, but by other cues as well. Finally, we also have uh, a what and where stream here. Um, we have a what stream that flows forward in this sequence. So it flows to the anterior part of the temporal lobe and then to the prefrontal cortex. We have a, a this is involved in identifying the object. So um, it's what is producing that sound. Is it grandma? Is it some, some animal? Is it a violin? And the wear stream, in contrast, goes backwards here to Wernicke's and then up along here back to the frontal lobe. And that's involved in temporal the sound localization, and also in determining the temporal properties that is uh, important for understanding the, what, what the word is, the temporal properties of the sound is what tells you the, 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 the sound of a word. 
And that's the end. Thank you.